For those who missed my Wednesday episode, I apologize. I didn't make an episode this past Wednesday, and I'm going to be making some changes so that I can do a better job staying on schedule. The responses which I received to my episode on benevolence got me thinking. While I stand by what I said, there are some important aspects of the discussion which I missed. I gave a pretty thorough overview of how benevolence should work for people who can do for themselves, but I did not address where the line is between those who can do for themselves and those who can't. Nor did I speak about what we should do for those who need help. Let's talk about benevolence some more, shall we? When our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. As you remember, I believe strongly that continuously providing for people who can support themselves is not helping them. It creates dependency where there should be none, and I think that they are better served when given the tools to solve their own problems. I specifically use the word indigent in those statements as well, and for some that provoked a strong reaction. I should not have used that word, and I should have better explained which people for whom I think we need to be providing. Indigent, as defined by Merriam-Webster, means to suffer from extreme poverty. I admit that changes the meaning of what I said in my first video on benevolence. It's entirely my fault that I used that word improperly. The proper word which I should have used instead is indolent, averse to activity, effort, or movement. I meant to say that those who can support themselves in this world but don't through a lack of effort, are better served through education and motivation rather than providing them with financial support. Indolence is closely tied to ignorance, and we can cure ignorance with education. I also didn't state that there are some who need our financial support on an ongoing basis, perhaps even a permanent one. Don't! Missed it by that much. The first group of people for whom we should be providing support is minors. Some children may be able to support themselves if they had to do so, but children should never be forced into this situation. Ever. They are kids. They should be playing and growing. Their primary responsibility is to learn, and our responsibility as adults is to make certain that they have the best education available, with all their needs met, and plenty of time to spend having fun. Children should be given age-appropriate responsibilities as part of their education process. Using the fish example from a previous video, they should be given a fish and taught how to fish. Eventually, the little darlings do grow up, and when children become adults, they need the best chance of success that we can provide them. If we don't teach them how to fish, then they grow up to be significantly disadvantaged adults perhaps even become indolent because of the ignorance in which they were raised. The second group of people for whom we should be providing support is the elderly. Past a certain point in every life, working becomes difficult if not impossible. Throughout human history, one can find examples of how successful societies provide for their elderly population, and this is only fair. After all, the elderly are the parents and grandparents of the working population. We have a collective duty to our elders to provide for them in their last years what they provided for us in our first years. I see elderly people who are forced to take part-time jobs to supplement their income, and I am saddened by it. If Grandpa wants to work at the local store as a door greeter just to stay busy, then that's fine. But when Grandpa has to work there because we aren't taking care of him, then we are failing him. The minimum amount that Social Security pays for low-income seniors isn't enough to keep them from needing additional support programs like the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program and subsidized housing. We need to work on making Social Security completely solvent and make certain that seniors can live on what they draw from Social Security. 
I would actually prefer that seniors were able to take care of their Social Security and Medicare business in one government office, so that if we can correct these issues with below minimum support being provided, they can spend less time traveling from office to office, gathering benefits from a dozen different agencies just to survive their retirement. In my fish analogy, we share our fish with those who taught us to fish and cannot fish anymore. The third group of people for whom we should be providing support is those with disabilities. Now I can hear some of my conservative friends grumbling about this, but hear me out. People with disabilities have a medical condition which prevents them from working like someone who is able. For the many people whose disabilities are apparent, like those who are blind, paralyzed, or amputees, getting people to agree that they need assistance is pretty easy. For those whose disabilities are invisible, like those with mental health conditions, rallying support to them is not so easy. Obviously, if people cannot see what's going on, then they cannot understand why a combat vet with PTSD deserves the same support as a combat vet who lost a leg. They are less likely to want to help a person with crippling anxiety than someone with crippling arthritis. But these people do need our help. It doesn't matter if we can see what their medical condition is. They have a medical condition which interferes with their ability to work, to go to school, or to perform other major life functions, and we need to help them out. That's why I spent several years working in an office which provides such access to students with disabilities on a university campus, and why even though I have moved on to another job at the university, I still advocate for these students. Some of them can learn to fish if the fishing pole is adapted for their use. Others can learn other ways to support themselves that help to catch fish, like baiting hooks for people. Part of supporting people with disabilities is helping them to find a way to support themselves, if we can. Still, we have to accept that many will not be able to fish or to help others to fish, and we have a duty to provide for them just like we would our elders. In my case, I have family members who have disabilities. Some have adapted to working in regular jobs, some have jobs which are within the scope of their limitations, and some are just unable to work. They are all my family, though, and I support each of them as they need within the scope of my abilities. Every person with a disability is someone's family member and a part of American society. We have a collective duty to help them, just as we have a collective duty to children and the elderly. It boggles my mind why people don't understand that there is a finite limit to how much help is available, though. People who are able-bodied, able-minded adults should not need ongoing financial support on a permanent basis. If we aren't helping them to gain financial independence, then we are doing them, and us, a serious disservice. Like I said earlier, indolence is closely tied to ignorance, and ignorance can be cured. We just need to get to work educating the ignorant. We need to teach them practical life skills, help them to learn a trade, or go to college if that is within their capacity, make certain that there is a booming economy with plenty of decent paying jobs for them to go get, and keep the cost of living within reason to the best of our abilities. If we can do that, then in a while we will see benefits that my more progressive friends will embrace. Too many jobs and not enough people to work in them can be solved by increasing the number of legal immigrants which are allowed to enter the country. More people with disabilities who can support themselves because we found a way for them to work productively will mean more benefits available to those who cannot support themselves. More kids raised to be productive members of society will reduce the number of incarcerations and decrease the prison populations in time. This is enlightened self-interest, upon which John Nash based game theory. Mathematically, the best solution to most problems is one which benefits the individual and the group. Decisions which benefit only the individual give away benefits only available through a group effort. Decisions which only benefit the group will leave an altruist vulnerable to exploitation by a selfish person. I advocate for benefits which will help those less fortunate in our culture, but I do so in a manner which will also benefit me. 
It may not be a pure form of benevolence, but it is all that most people can manage. My progressive friends should remember that there is a limit past which the cost of providing benefits outweighs the positive effects of those benefits on society. My populist friends should remember that there will always be some who need our collective help to keep our society strong. Now that's just my opinion and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring that notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Central Time. Join me on the last Saturday of every month when I invite guests to join me in the kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.